Let's go. Joshua 14, we're going to read verses 6 through 14. We're going to wander away from it for a little while, and we'll get back to it. Then the children of Judah, they came unto Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephna, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee, Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land, and I brought him word again, as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty Five years, even since the Lord spoke this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. What has happened is he started out at 40. God gave him a promise. He waits 45 years. Now he's what's considered an old man, although the older I get, the younger 85 is. But nevertheless, he's a bit older. As yet I am strong... This day, as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now, for war, both to go out and to come in. Verse 12, now, therefore, give me this mountain, whereof the Lord spoke in that day. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so, be the Lord will be with me when I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of Jephna, Hebron, for an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephna, the Kenzanite, unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. Important to note, they were not just giants there, but It was a fenced city. Now, in the Old Testament, you generally did not mess with a fenced city. It means it was fortified. In our day, it would be a a, a huge house with with gates and well-known alarm systems and security. If you're going to rob somebody, you'd probably go to the neighbor and not bug that guy because you're for sure going to get hauled off to jail if you bother that guy. A fenced city was like that. It was fortified with warriors. It was the Marines, the Navy, the Army, whoever you like. They were there. They were going to protect. And you could not get in there easily beyond the fact it was inhabited by the Anakins, which were giants. I want to talk to you for a few moments this morning about the size of your soul. The size of your soul is often determined when you're under pressure. This we have seen, this we have known. I think uh, sometimes we betray ourselves when the chips are down. Sometimes we announce who we are when the chips are down. Joshua and Caleb, it is by the trouble of their heart that they are purified, and it is still true to us today. Prosperity has the tendency to shadow the soul. Dreams can become lethargic. I like prosperity, don't get me wrong. I I think it's great, but sometimes it can destroy the imagination of the thinker and wilts the affection of the dreamer. So in good times and bad, we are supposed to remember who God is in us less than who we are in God and find those humble moments. So if you're going through a hard time and you're looking at a fenced city, I need you to remember that this is who you are. What comes out of you is who you are, and you'll decide and determine how much work you need uh, at that juncture. Amen? Cornelius Tacitus was a Roman 
senator and historian from the first century. And he had gone through a lot, and he said this, adversity has no friends. You are most often alone in your worst adversity, and I want to tell you it's the best place you can be because this is where you hear God like you had not heard him before. This is where you reach out because there's nothing uh, left to do. Caleb and Joshua were two men out of 12 who said that God would empower the children of Israel to go forward and do all manner of things and take the loan. Take, they would alone take the land. I would like to tell you that out of the 12, two were excellent and 10 were losers. And why were they losers? Because they said that God couldn't do it. They lent themselves to their fear and not to their God. Men who said two things that would strike failure into a nation, they said these two things, and consider your life this way. One, the walls, not only were there walls, but the walls were not only tall, the walls were too tall. When they said the walls were too tall, it not only had to do with the inescapable horror of getting over the wall, but the fact that there were walls anyway. The fact that the walls existed was bad enough, but they were struck down by the fear of the fact that these walls were tall. And the second thing they did to discourage an entire nation from walking in its promises is they said the giants are too strong. So the walls are too tall and the giants are too strong. But when God gives you a promise, don't ever discount it and say it is just a thought of your own. It is a dream of your own. The walls are tall. The giants are strong. But they are not too tall and they are not too strong. If you hold on for what the Lord has for you, all things will be made right. Amen? Amen. I want to mention the danger of hesitation in this. Israelites had left the land of Egyptian captivity. And after being captured for a little over 400 years, they came to this place called Kadesh Barnea. And it's important in your life that you recognize sometimes you are in between the place of Bethel, which is the house of God, and Ai, which is the place of destruction. There is a crossroads there, and you have to decide which way you're going to go. And, and when you go that way, you have to tell yourself, I'm all in. I, I have to be all in. Otherwise, I join the other ten. And I am afraid of the tall walls, and I'm afraid of the strong giants. God's not afraid of those things, and your life will only manifest the fear of those things and the concern of those things as you pay attention to it. The name Kadesh means holiness. Often we associate the word holiness with all the do's and the don'ts. But holiness, in its real sense, means this, a separation, a separation unto God. A separation away from the world. A separation from your weakness. A separation, like Alta said, from laziness. A separation for your desire to lose. A separation from what you want because it's easy. Unto God. That's what holiness is. It's separating yourself unto God. And it takes stamina and endurance, right? So you have to teach your body how to win spiritual things. You have to force yourself to get up. You have to commit unto consecration that you would be in the word, that you would change your habits. You'd change things so that you could become the two and not the ten, so that you could prefer the Lord, and that even if you had to wait 40 years, you're just as strong and able to take the mountain, and you know it. 
What a beautiful thing. But Caleb did not lose sight of that. Here was Israel's opportunity to separate herself from the tentacles of Egypt. When they got to the point of separation, they found their faith and their patience being tested. They hesitated, and and so they lost. The thing about adversity is that it, it helps us to know who God is. Because he's always pulling us through. Amen? There were dreams and promises. There were hopes that they had to wait on the Lord to be fulfilled. And they knew that. But when somebody takes it away from you, you have to fight even harder. And so I say, don't give the enemy a voice. Out of ten people... Not one of them sided with Caleb and Joshua, which to me is weird because an excellent spirit was on them. You know, when Stephen is murdered, Acts chapter 7, is it? Something is said that is a complication to my heart forever. The people who had come to kill him for their own selfish gain, put it in perspective of your life, do we kill the thing, the idea, the concept, the opportunity because it's inconvenient for us? Do we work hard to slaughter it even though we know it's good? They looked at him and said, man, He's got the face of an angel. They heard his word. They felt the spirit of God on him. They they recognized that it was God, but they killed him anyway. Why is that? Because it's human nature? Probably so. But I'll tell you something else that it is. Somebody who wants to be bound by their laziness. They want to be bound by their fear. They want to be bound by the things of this world that they have pledged allegiance to. Because otherwise they would be wrong. And they were stuck. They were stuck on the edge of greatness and could not jump over the edge. There is a small flower. Now it's called a sundew. And it has a a tiny, very tiny, but very beautiful red bloom. Now, it said the delicate buds are clustered in a network of very small branches in this flower. They will climb a wall or a fence, and they wait for only 12 hours on one day to bloom. Unlike a morning glory that will come in the morning and be glorious... They come out when there's sun and they fade away and they come out again. The sundew waits for a single day and instinctively somehow chooses this day and goes up as high as it can. And if there is no sun on that day or if the skies are overcast or perhaps it's rainy, then the uppermost bud will wither and die. If the next climbing bud finds the same condition, it too will wither and die, never to bloom again, for it had found its one opportunity and either succeeded or failed. The chill of hesitation will wither your heart if you don't do what God's telling you to do. The human heart is often in the same mode. We decide we're going to give it one try. And if the planets are not lined up and everything's not perfect, we fade away and say, well, I'm never going to believe that again. Spiritual life can never afford to be static. It has to be dynamic. It has to be growing constantly, being pushed forward. Amen? 
It isn't something that you can lean on somebody uh, else to do. Turn to the book of Numbers real quick. The 12 spies, they went to the land of Canaan. They admired the fruit that grew in great abundance, which is good to know. But they weren't willing to pay the price to eat of it. They saw it, they recognized it, but they, they didn't want to pay the price to own it. They admired the land and how comfortable a home that it would be. Yet and still, the strong giants and the tall walls threw them off, terrorized their hearts. Listen to their words, Numbers 13, 32 to 33. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land, although which we have gone to search it, is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof and all the people that we saw in it. They are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. So we were in their sight. They're not only interpreting their own terror, but they're interpreting their demise, how it must be to be a giant. They had forgotten the fact that the giants very well could be afraid of them for the power of God on them. They didn't give God that chance. When people get out of sync with God, mole hills look like mountains. If you're fired up about something, it doesn't make a lot of sense, then you're missing some things. You're out of sync. You should be able to lay those things down. When prayer rooms become silent, and dreams begin to die, then you know that there's a place in your heart you have not given to God. It isn't your job to figure anything out. It's your job to allow the Lord to figure everything out. Continue with me, Numbers 14, and we're going to be done in a minute. 1 through 10, I want to show you about this mountain. And all the congregation, they lifted up their voice and they cried. And the people... They wept that night. And all of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephna, which were of them that searched the land, they tore their clothes and they spoke unto all the company of the children of Israel, and they said, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us unto this land and give it us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bed stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before the children of the Lord. Choices matter. You have to follow where God's leading you. And I'm sure it's not going to make sense all the time. Charlotte and Charles, when the Lord told you to buy that house, you didn't have the money to do it. You didn't have the finance to sustain the monthly outpour that it was going to take. But you did what God said, and then God provided. Amen? How many, how many of you, Altus, when you bought that house, what a nightmare. You know, and then boom, 
remodeling and then God blessed and blessed so much that you can bless others and it's from, it's from obedience. I mean, I could call so many of you out just, uh, just to say what an amazing story there is upon each one of you. The Nobrigas, we're moving there. We don't know what's going on, but we need to be part of the church. We need to be there. Through obedience, right? Through obedience. The Sloans, you gave up everything. You lost all your friends, all your... I mean, what a nightmare you guys went through. But you stood and said, you know what? Mm -mm. We're supposed to be spiritually trained. We're not playing church. We're not playing church. No way. Everybody in here has a story of where they had to stand and people were like, are you out of your mind? You're maybe so, but I'm trying to get the mind of the Lord. That's the trick here. God will honor those things. Laying yourself down, right, Teresa? And lifting the Lord up and saying, I'm going to do what he says. It's not always easy. God's going to bless you as you lay yourself down in obedience. Amen? It isn't supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be awesome. And sometimes awesome's not easy, but it's still awesome. Two questions that I have for you. What direction are the choices that you're making taking you? You take notes in here, so take that note. What direction are the choices you make taking you? Where are your choices taking you? Number two, how deep are the marks of your negative choices? When we make a bad choice, sometimes it's, it's difficult to say you're wrong, it's hard to back out of it, but you've got to. And you've got to examine those negative things and turn them around and say, I give you to God. C.S. Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity, he said, every time you make a choice, you are turning the central part of you, the part of you that chooses into something a little different from what it was before, and taking your life as a whole with all your innumerable choices all your life long, you are slowly turning the sensual thing either into a heavenly creature or into a hellish creature, either, either to a creature that is in harmony with God and with other creatures and with itself, or else into one that is in a state of war, hatred with God and with its fellow creatures, and hatefulness and selfishness unto itself. To be the one kind of creature is heaven. That is, it is joy and peace and knowledge and power. To be the other means madness, horror, idiocy, and rage, and eternal loneliness, unholiness full of self-righteousness and selfishness and fear. Each of us at each moment is progressing to one state or the other. It may be that one man's anger sheds the blood of a thousand and another man's anger However angry he gets, he will only be laughed at. But the little mark on the soul may be much the same in both. Each has done something to himself, which unless he repents, will make it harder for him to keep out of the rage next time he is tempted, to keep out of the sin next time he is tempted, and will make the rage worse when he does fall prey to it. Each man, each woman, each child must flow unselfishly toward God. Each of them, if he seriously turns to God, can have that twist in the central man straightened out again. Each is, in the long run, doomed if he will not. In closing, I would like to show you something different about Caleb. Was the cry of the mountain. Caleb's soul heard it. Strong in the face of doubt, strong in the face of time, strong in the presence of his peers, he had that mountain in his soul. He was told he would have that mountain, and the mountain cried to him. He allowed the mountain to cry to him. Allow your dreams to cry back at you. The same spirit that Caleb had needs to be heard every day. 
if our voices, if they are loud and they are strong, the careless and the thoughtless will have to respect that. Amen? Amen. Joshua 14, 7. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to read it to you. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. Caleb's words were not meant to please the crowd. It was in his heart because God put it there. His devotion to God and his understanding of the promise of God is what led him. Can you stand? Let the goodness of the Lord cry to you. Let the thing that he's told you cry to you. Be not afraid of the tall walls or the strong giants. Psalm 57, 7 says, my heart is fixed. Oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and I will give praise. To have a fixed heart means this. To be fixed is to be firm, stable, secure. To endure and be enduring, to be determined, knowing that it was God and not your situation or your convenience. It is to be steadfast. It is to be settled. To be fixed is to be ready. The cry of the mountain and the dream or the vision that God has given you, it has to be fixed. It has to be ready. It has to be steady. Unwavering. Know that God gave it to you. And this month of September, as we are fasting and we're going forward, God will give you those souls that you are to pray through. Do not forget to continue believing. Amen. Reaching out, I 